we will have Dr. Suarez uh, up with the uh, surgical perspectives of LVADs. Thank you again. So I'm just going to briefly go over the actual implantation of an LVAD. They're relatively straightforward. You have two anastomosis, apex of the heart, and the uh, aorta is what is aortic anastomosis. You got to get a tunneler and drive uh, and uh, and get the drive line out of the body. That's about it. Uh, the the pump selection is another hour long talk. People kind of debate which one is better, when to use it. The ones that you're mainly going to be seeing are the HeartMate 3 and the HVAD in the future. HeartMate 2 is still the most common uh, uh, LVAD that's out there. There are thousands of people who are currently living on, on HeartMate 2, but there's been more and more push that perhaps the HeartMate 3 is at least equivalent, if not better in, in some ways, uh, to that pump right now, at least in terms of uh, pump thrombosis. Uh, <clears throat> The parts of the surgery that you, you're going to be that are going to be important for you are the TEE that that Dr. Singh just uh, spoke about, deciding how you're going to actually going to cannulate the uh, patient, uh, putting in your inflow, putting in your outflow at the aortic anastomosis, where you're going to put your your uh, your drive line. You got to make sure you de air, everything's dry, and 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 then what you look out for during those procedures as well as your closure. Uh, on the TEE, Dr. Singh spoke about the big three things that you're going to be looking out for from an anesthesiologist or a surgical out, out, uh, outlook. If someone has moderate or higher aortic insufficiency, you need to do something about it. Either a, people debate what, what to do with it, either uh, occlude the aortic valve, oversew it. Some people take stitches and just oversew it. The issue with that is that if you put in an LVAD, you will be dependent on the LVAD. If something happens to the LVAD, if it clots off, then you're going to have major issues. Uh, a lot of people just replace the valve with a bioprosthetic valve, which is uh, our, our preference. Uh, if you have it after, if you see it after the LVAD, that's another issue as well, because to put an uh, exchange valve on someone who's in heart failure, who's already had a LVAD and redo chest, uh, people have options for that. Sometimes people do go back in and replace the valve. Other people are starting to like to see if TAVR is an option on, on those patients as well. Some people put in occluders. If you have a PFO, you need to fix it. Like Dr. Singh said, you're going to become hypoxic because you'll pull blood over from the right side and push it into your left system. Un uh, un uh, oxygenated blood will get your body hypoxic. If someone has severe tricuspid regurgitation, that's something that's a little bit debatable. Some people like to fix it. Uh, just putting the LVAD itself in is, is going to decrease your PA pressures and, and decrease your regurgitation. But sometimes if you have a very dilated tricuspid valve, it's not enough. And those people are going to be prone to right heart failure. Right heart failure is your big issue after you put in an LVAD. We, our, our preference is to go in and put in a, a K-suture, which are two pledgeted sutures at the, uh, at the juncture of the anterior and posterior leaf of the uh, tricuspid valve. You basically take the annulus and cinch it together with two valves, with uh, two pledgeted sutures, and, and that along with the LVAD usually is enough to, to treat all of the reg uh, regurgitation we see and, and we think uh, um, minimize the uh, right heart failure postoperatively. Uh, Cannulation is usually straightforward. You either do standard uh, or, or bicaval if you have to do another procedure. There are some people who are, who are uh, attempting LVAD placements off pump for uh, innovative exposures. We, we've been able to do HVADs off pump. HeartMate 2s you're always going to have to do on pump as, as well. Uh, we've actually done something with HeartMate 2s where we actually sew on our outflow graft first and use that, that graft as our, basically as our cannula. We'll, we'll put our, the cardiopulmonary bypass and screw it in basically directly into the graft and, and instead of uh, putting in a aortic cannula, which, which we like to do. The thing with that is that you have to come off completely off pump before you uh, start your LVAD with that. And a little shout out for what we call our, um, Dr. Matthias Lobi was the uh, surgeon here before, uh, before me and he, he uh, helped popularize his use of what he calls the Berlin Bridge, which, which is basically cannulating the pulmonary artery. When you cannulate the pulmonary artery, you can use it, either use it to suck out blood or uh, if, if need be, after you start your LVAD and come off pump, you have a cannula to, to go on RVAD support immediately. And uh, it's a nice gentle kind of a landing for the RV after you go straight on LV support that, that we like to use. And it's, I think all, all these things together have, have made it so that we haven't had, I think, a, uh, uh, a need for post -op, immediate post-op RV support for, for at least the last year. So we have a pretty low... Uh, rate of needing RVAD support uh, postoperatively. Uh, if you do, uh, this is kind of how we do a Berlin Bridge on the, uh, on, on the upper side, this is your venous return, heads up, legs are down, the venous return from the, uh, from the right atria. This is from the pump and goes up to the aorta, 
This is your uh, standard aortic line sucked from the right atria, put into the aorta. We also have a pulmonary artery cannula where this line comes from. This is the pulmonary artery uh, with the sump suction that, that pulls back uh, in, into the pump. So you're just sucking out blood to kind of clear your field of view. This is what we call a bridge. This joins the two circuits so that uh, after we come off pump, what we can do is just clamp off the aortic line, clamp off this sump suction so that you're pulling from the, from the right, uh, right atria, the venous return, and then you're ret returning back into the pulmonary artery, you're on an RVAD. And it's nice to have that artery in place so that you're not crashing on RVAD support if you need to. It's something that we can start immediately. And it's just a personal preference. Very, pretty much no one else <laughs> does it against us. And uh, uh, Dimbisky in California was one of the first guys who came up with this. He wanted to call this the California Connection, I think, and <laughs> instead of the Berlin Bridge. Um, uh, choosing the apical coring site, when you're actually doing it, you're going to pull up the, if you're doing it through a sternotomy, you're going to pull up the, uh, the LV, put a couple of towels behind it so the apex is pointing out you. You can feel the dimple. If you just go to the apex, it's going to be like a, a thinned out area of the heart, and you can feel, you feel where, where the dimple is. Uh, most people now go straight on the dimple. Some people choose to go a little anterior to it because the point is you want to get your cannula pointed at the mitral valve to pull out the, uh, to pull out the blood in most laminar flow. Uh, and least turbulent. Uh, you're going to go. You're going to see the left anterior descending coronary artery. You're just going to go uh, <coughs> lateral to it, right next to it. You feel the dimple. Some people go a little anterior and lateral to it. Uh, we just, uh, if you ever get a chance to look at a pig heart, just just poke your finger in the uh, apex or cut off the apex, and you can see that if you go right at the apex, it usually pointed straight at the mitral valve. Uh, you will, if it's someone very difficult to see, it's a lot of adhesions or, or you just can't see the surface anatomy very well, very dilated heart. Echo is very helpful in, in just kind of poking at the heart and seeing where your finger is going or else getting a needle, putting it in and seeing where the needle is, is pointed to before you actually go ahead and, and core out your, your uh, left ventricle. Uh, like I said, you point it towards the mitral valve. Uh, Next door at Texas Heart, Bud Frazier and, and the guys over at, at Herman, they like doing a, a diaphragmatic insertion where you're just, uh, where you actually just go on the posterior section of the posterior to the dimple. And it's actually just a, about a third away, um, actually two thirds away down the posterior descending coronary artery is where they like to, to, to put in their pump and, and it, it points it slightly differently. But as long as basically the cannula is in the biggest reservoir of, of blood you can Get. Usually there's not an issue. It's a nice, uh, we've actually used it a couple times when someone has a very calcified apex and I know I'm not going to be able to get into it. It's an option that, that we've used as well and it, and it works. Uh, you're going to sew on, all the pumps have an apical sewing ring, which actually I have here. I should, it's easier for you guys to kind of like, I was going to get you guys just to pass around. I know the anesthesiologist got to, to see some of the pumps. I want you guys to, to take take a look at it and just pass around we'll talk. This is what you're going to be sewing on to the heart itself. It's just this, this soft, uh, soft felt, uh, felt ring with a, with a metal, uh, metal lattice to kind of uh, support it. And you, uh, most people just sew this ring onto the left ventricle, as you can see that, with interrupted uh, Tychron sutures. Uh, we usually use 12 double-armed, go, go uh, through the heart in a, in a horizontal mattress fashion, circumferentially, and uh, you basically got to sew this on and make sure it's not bleeding uh, around there. The, the heart tissue is sometimes very soft. The uh, HeartMate 3 is on their fourth iteration of this apical sewing ring because it is a little larger, and the larger it is, there's a little bit more tension on, on the heart, on, on the outskirts of it. It can tear a bit more. The um, HVAD one usually is it's a little bit more stable, not, not much of a worry, but I'm just going to let you guys kind of look at the pumps themselves because I think it's probably the best way for you to... see the HVAD pump itself in there with its sewing in and, and the coring knife. Um, uh, for the HeartMate uh, 2 and the HeartMate 3, you can uh, cut in, uh, into the heart first and then sew it on. People have their different preferences on which one they think is more hemostatic. We usually do sew and cut, but uh, for the HeartMate 2, we almost always would, would core out the left ventricle itself if we want to, put in our sutures where you can see them go in and, in and out very well, and then, then uh, uh, go through the cuff and parachute it down. Uh, important when you do core out that you look inside the heart and make sure there aren't any trabeculations that'll get sucked in to the LVAD itself. So any extra loose trabeculations, you, you can cut them out. Um, for an HVAD, the way you core the HVAD itself, once you've sewn in the uh, sewing green, you make a, a cruciate incision, take an oven blade and make a little cross in there. And the coring knife that, that you'll see in that pump itself uh, is, 
is right here on the on the right. This little part is what what actually cuts. Uh, it's it's sharp on these edges. You have you can push it out. It goes into the heart. Then you pull it back in. It it cuts the heart. You turn around in a circle and and you take a nice little core of tissue. Um, you can play around with it when uh, when it comes around to you to to take a look. It is sharp. Be careful. <laughs> uh, after you've, you've uh, put on your apical sewing ring, you're actually going to put in the pump. On the HeartMate 3, you have to lock it in place uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, pushing down this lock that's actually on the pump itself. It's this purple little uh, knob here that you, you push down. You'll see some yellow, uh, uh, yellow, um, yellow on it as well. You need to make sure that all the yellow is hidden to know that it, it, it's locked into place and isn't going to come out. The heart, the HVAT itself, you, you insert it and then there, you screw it in. There's a little screwdriver that you're going to turn in until you hear a clicking noise. Again, the screwdriver will be in there that you can play around with as well. Uh, finally, a after you've you've uh, put in your pump, you, you'll uh, you'll do your aortic anastomosis and that's basically straightforward. You want to make sure it's lying kind of along the right right gutter. Uh, it's not too long uh, where, where it'll kink but not too short where it'll be right on top of the RV or stretch out and, and both those issues, both those uh, options can give um, uh, problems with, with clotting. Uh, people usually just put a partial occluding clamp on the aorta, make an uh, aortotomy incision and then suture anastomosis. You guys know how to put in, but now well, you're going to learn how to, if you haven't, how to put in proximal is pretty straightforward. It's just a very large proximal, just pointed a different uh, direction. Uh, you're gonna have to you'll you'll de it and um, and uh, put a clamp across the uh, the uh, the uh, yeah I'll, I'll flow graph to uh, once you take out the parts of the clamp too. Important differences are, are the HeartMate three and the HeartMate two. They have a larger uh, graph size. It's it's 15 millimeters versus the HVAD, which is 10 millimeters. So just make sure you look at the size of your your uh, your graph before you suture it on. Most people will bevel it. You'll you'll cut it so that it's like a 45 degree angle and kind of angled so that the outflow goes goes uh, distal on the aorta and not back towards the valve. Um, and basically that that's it. It's pretty straightforward there. Uh, once you you sutured your your uh, your LVAD in, you you uh, bo both pumps come with basically a big spear that you kind of shove through the the patient's uh, chest wall and. Uh, and use uh, and attach it to a drive line and, and to pull it through. If, if you have a right-handed patient, they usually like it on the left, so they can play around with, with the connections. If they're left-handed, they may want one on the right. Just something to make sure you ask them before. Uh, they both have velour to help it uh, um, uh, scar in into the patient's tissue. People used to leave the velour part of the 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 fabric part of the drive line outside of the body. It has a high high rate of uh, infection that way. So now pretty much everyone, will, when you take your drive line, make sure you keep the, the velour inside the body to let it uh, um, scar in there, but not enough that it'll, not outside so that bacteria don't don't uh, infect it and go down it and climb into the mediastinal space, which is a big issue. Uh, coming off pump, Dr. Singh spoke about, uh, they both have uh, different uh, starting uh, RPMs. When you start your HVAD, it'll it'll start at 1800 RPMs. When you start your HeartMate 3, it'll start at 3000. HeartMate 2s, if uh, you're playing with those, those start at 6000 RPMs. Uh, usually, you'll come off pump a little bit. The, the anesthesia you'll you'll be supporting for for a little bit of uh, time, but up to two liters, there's usually no big issues. Around two liters is when you start start the pump. Slowly go up, go down on on your uh, on your on your bypass, and and go from there. Uh, and we usually like to end between 23 and 2500 RPMs on HVAD. That's a preference. And 48 to 5200 on HeartMate 3. Again, you're going to be looking at the echo the in entire time to make sure that the LV is still nice and full of blood. You like it to be nice and and uh, filled. If you start seeing it, it sucked down a little bit, you're going to see the right heart. Or it'll be either because the right heart is struggling or you're going too high on the RPMs. Your first move, if you see collapsing, is to go down on the RPMs. Uh, you'll need some inotropic support. People will want to give lots of volume when you see that. Be careful with the volume because usually the right heart is struggling at that point. You add a lot of volume, you're, you're going to make it struggle more. Uh, so usually the answer is inotropic support come down on the uh, RPMs to kind of get over that, that hump. Um, and uh, after you're done, People like to cover their, their pumps with different things. We like to put a, another um, chemo-shield graft over our outflow, just so if you, you're cutting through in, in future surgery for redo uh, transplant, something to protect the graft, because if you cut through that graft, you're cutting through the aorta when you, when you do your, your redo heart transplant. Some people like to uh, 
suit your Gore-Tex. It'll be an institutional preference, what you like, to, what you think is going to min minimize your, your, uh, your difficulty of entry during, during your, your reduced surgery, and everyone's going to have their different opinions on, on how to do that. Um, and that's about it. This is Dr. Noonan Frazier watching myself and Brian put in the first heart made three in Texas, and that was, I just realized, over three years ago, and that's really scary to me. So <laughs> thank you guys very much. Thank you.